This is Startup Storefront. We've all encountered instant foods. The trend of convenience took over American society after World War II and dominated the consumer market with a big assist from the microwave oven. You could eat instant oatmeal in the morning, a cup of noodles for lunch, and a TV dinner at night, all ready to eat with the touch of a few buttons on your microwave. Eventually, consumers realized that the trade-off of convenience for nutrition was not in their overall best interest, and thus the better for you market was born. There are many brands within this new market that have shunned the instant label, not wanting to be associated with the unhealthy connotations that the label brings with it. Our guest today is Kevin Lee, co-founder of Immy, a brand that has innovated its way into becoming a healthier instant ramen option. So listen in as we cover everything from not knowing how to ask for help and why that's a cultural problem, why starting a company has involved equal parts personal and professional development, and why you shouldn't overthink which social media platform you use to reach your audience. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Kaylee, founder of Emmy. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for having me. What made you want to start this amazing ramen company? Yeah, I have a very non-traditional CPG background. Maybe some of your guests have as well. Um, I actually spent the past 10 years in the tech industry. So, you know, was a product manager in tech, was actually an early stage investor at a few like very tech focused VCs, but most recently was leading food and beverage investing at a firm called Pear Ventures. And that really happened you know, kind of, uh, I would say randomly in a way. The long story short is my co-founder and I actually grew up in Asian food families. My grandparents are produce farmers in Taiwan and when my parents immigrated here to, from Taiwan, one thing that immigrant parents do is they'll leave the kids back with the grandparents while they're trying to build a life in America because they have you know, no financial or social capital. And so a lot of my childhood was actually like literally in the fields with my grandparents, like picking, stemming, like packaging this fruit called a rose apple. And it's funny because that experience, people think like, oh, well, from there, you must have been influenced to like go into food. But actually, it's it's like running a farm is like totally different than totally. You know, doing a CPG business. But I do think that because it's like in my family lineage, in my blood, there is something there where it's like it's hard to escape that that circle. And I, I think it's a you know, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing that I've just come to realize over time. But my co-founder and I. You know, his grandmother also was running like a hawker egg noodle stand in Thailand. His dad was running like a Thai restaurant in LA selling noodles. And both of us, um, after a decade in tech, I think naturally when you get older, you start to care a lot more about your personal health. Yeah. And also you just see your family getting older. So both of my parents, for example, have very high blood pressure. They've taken medication for years. My grandmother's pre-diabetic. My co-founder, Kei Chan, his family also has very high rates of diabetes and high blood pressure. And so... When we got together a few years ago, we said, well, you know, one of the best ways to tackle health issues is not post the fact, but it's, you know, pre during the nutrition phase when, you know, with what they're consu people are consuming. Mm -hmm. And we knew we wanted to work on a better for you food and beverage brand, but we didn't want to just start like, you know, another, you know, American flavored like sure. protein bar company. Like we want to do things that we really uh, were uniquely suited to do. And because we grew up in Asian food families, that's what we've eaten our whole lives. Mm -hmm. We said, well, you know, let's take a look at the American landscape. Uh, Asian food is the number one, like fastest growing cuisine in the US. It's the number two takeout food after pizza. Yet, you know, when you think about most Asian food in America, there isn't like a single brand that's trying to be a better for you Asian American food brand. And so Amy started really add out of that quote unquote thesis, but really it was just like, hey, we're, we're two friends. We have a long history, like working together. We knew we'd have a lot of fun doing this and we knew that it was like something that we, we were uniquely suited to do. So that was the genesis behind Emmy and then Instant Ramen. I, I wish I could tell you that I did a lot of like category research with my co-founder, but the truth is, is that we grew up eating this stuff. It's the first thing that like we learned to make when our parents were at work, that, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have anything mm -hmm. to eat at home. I think you ask any stranger on the street, they'll probably tell you, oh yeah, I've, I've had Instant Ramen probably in college is like, you know, whether it was the drunk food or the cheap food. Sure. Course, and then like yeah. I stopped eating it because you realize how bad it is for you. Oh, yeah. And so we didn't really like do that much research, but we said, hey, let's let's just try reinventing this stuff. I think we both at the time really cared about the low carb value prop because of our family's diabetes history. Um, we knew we wanted to reduce obviously like the sodium, which was a big concern for customers. The high plant based proteins and being plant based was something that came uh, actually just like, I think that was also part of our research, but for example, like both of our families now are actually primarily plant-based. 
or I think you know Ross McKay calls it plant forward or something yeah. was, yeah. was the term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Ross. Yeah, shout out to <laughs> Ross. <laughs> but yeah, that was the that was the idea, and I think you know after the fact we came to realize, like holy crap, this is a forty six billion dollar industry. Um, it's a massive industry. It's dominated by pretty much like three Asian conglomerates who own like ninety one percent of the market share. And they haven't changed their formula in the past 60 years. When you first started, I know, at least in like the Latino culture, there's this thing where as soon as you tell someone they're going to remove sugar and add like stevia or like a monk fruit extract oh, or anything yeah. like that, they freak out. They go, no, I don't want it. Totally. And so when you're saying this point around like you wanted to go ahead and highlight that it was it was like healthier for you. Yeah. Is that something that your community, the people that eat ramen are like, oh yeah, that's good. Or were they like, no, it's going to taste like crap. <laughs> Cause that's a real barrier. Cause I know what ends up happening. A lot of coffee shops here will do healthier desserts. So they'll make very traditional Latino focused desserts. So that they post it on Instagram knowing that the grandchild sees it, right. but the, the grandmother doesn't cause she doesn't have an Instagram account. And then it's like the world's little secret, <laughs> which is really interesting from like a marketing perspective. That is really interesting. You know, for us very quickly early on, we realized that like for someone who has grown up eating a certain cuisine, convincing them that there's, you know, this better for you premium option is going to be something that they should eat because it's actually healthier for them. That's, that's very difficult. You're always the most critical of your own cuisine because you grew up eating the good stuff, whether that's from your families, your grandparents. So we knew early on that like our Asian communities, for example, who, you know, were very familiar with instant ramen, likely they were not going to be the early adopters. And we actually knew this from talking with like some of our investors and advisors, like the, one of the co-founders of Boba Guys, for example, um, I don't know if you heard of this, but you know, it's like a very modern Boba like cafe in a way. And Boba used to be reserved just for like, it was like a very niche, like Asian thing. And now they've really modernized it for a broader audience. And they said in the beginning, like, Asians were super critical of their product because they're like, look, you guys are trying to like modernize this. It is very expensive. Like what the hell are you guys doing? And now you walk in any one of their stores and it's like, you see every single race, every single ethnicity there, Asians included. So I think this is a barrier that we knew going into it. And it was honestly a dream of ours where one day, you know, people like my parents, my grandparents would eat this and be like, I can't even tell it's different. So you know, there's a long story behind this, but we actually launched like a first version of Emmy last January. How did you do that? And so you ended up, so you're here, you are, you're a product manager at a tech company, which means you can speak to basically anyone. You can speak to salespeople, you can speak to your, your VC groups and also obviously your engineers. And so having that skill set is drastically, I mean, it's really important. Mm -hmm. And so when you decided to embark on food, are you working with chefs? Did you go to a lab and all of a sudden just start trying new things? What was the first step in, in getting the first iteration of the product? Yeah, it's funny. My co-founder and I don't have any like chef or food science backgrounds at mm -hmm. all. And people were always like, well, how did you create, you know, the, this new type of ramen? And the first thing we did was what like anyone would do when they're trying to learn something, which is we went straight on YouTube and we yeah. literally typed in, how do you make ramen? And we would watch like <laughs> these like home chefs make ramen We'd watch like factories and try to analyze like how did their machines work. And the first 200 versions of Emmy, actually we made ourselves in our own kitchens. So I think this is not a like uncommon story. Like some of our investors, like Peter Rahal at Arx Bar did the same thing with his co-founder. Um, I think it is good to have, to take that first principles approach of, Hey, we don't know what we don't know, but let's just try to imagine like, Hey, we're creating this ourselves. We really want these types of macros, this type of texture. We are very, like, we have very high standards for instant ramen because we grew up eating all the best kinds. So we knew the taste was there, like our, our taste for it was there, but getting to that point was very difficult. So the first hundred versions, like it, it was crazy. We would just go on Amazon and buy like Bob's Red Mill ingredients. And we would just like mix together things, produce noodles at home. Like literally mixing it, like we, literally we, like, making make it, it ourselves, your, handmade. Your apartment. It was like, it was like making pasta in a wow, way. Like we had sure. a pasta roller Okay. Um, and then at a certain point, you do hit like a, a local maximum of your quote unquote food science knowledge. And that's really where we did end up engaging with a, a chef, a food science PhD, some nutritionists. Um, we got their advice. And I think what's interesting is in tech, you know, if you're like coding a project and you learn and someone tells you like, hey, you spent like uh, a month using this programming language. You could have used this programming language and you could have cut that time down by like 2x. That's basically what the food science PhD and like the chef did for us was they came in and they were like, they watched us make, you know, these, our ramen. They were like, yo, you guys are doing like all sorts of weird things that like, or you're adding in all these extra steps that are totally unnecessary. Like if you cut this and this, your throughput will double. 
or it'll triple. And so we used to be able to only make like one recipe per hour maybe. And like when the food science PhD studied our process, he was like, I can actually triple your output. And then the chef in the other, on the other hand was like, you guys are using these like random ingredients from Amazon. Did you know that if you contact the suppliers, tell them you're a new food brand, they'll give you samples of like all their ingredients for free. And at the time we were like, wait, what? Like we've just been buying everything. And so they increased like the encyclopedia of all the ingredients. So when you increase the range of ingredients in your like toolbox and you increase the throughput, all of a sudden your, your experiment velocity just like increases dramatically. And that allowed us to then ramp up to the 200 versions very quickly and get us to like, you know, quote unquote, our V1 of what we were able to launch with our manufacturer. One of the more interesting things I came across uh, when I was looking into your developmental phase was, I think it was on your Instagram, it was something that K-Chan delved into all this research that existed about ramen uh, from, from all over Asia. But because they were in all different languages, he had to translate them using like Google Translate or whatever. And yeah. I think for, I speak for everyone who's ever used Google Translate, it's fine in short sentences, but I don't That's have terrible. any confidence <laughs> that it would be like word for word verbatim on a long document like that. Like, were you guys concerned that, or did you find out that you lost anything in translation? That's a great question. Um, so we found Japanese and Chinese research papers. We did use Google Translate. I actually had to ask my dad for help for, he, he speaks, he's obviously fluent in Mandarin. And so he would like help translate, but he would also sometimes get on calls with us when we would call like these noodle experts from Taiwan. So we spoke with like a, a bunch of noodle experts, him, one of my friend's older brothers would hop on the call and then they would just like literally be our translator. And that was actually one of the funniest things because when we, my co-founder and I first started this business, we did not know how to ask for help. That's the honest truth. I think most first time founders don't know how to do that. And it was only after that experience. Why, we, why is that? Is it because you were doing something so different from what you were doing before? Or is it just like a ego thing or you were just like blinders on focused? I actually think it's a cultural thing. Okay. I actually talk about this a lot, but you know, especially with immigrant parents, I don't know how it is in other cultures. In Asian culture, things like humility and like not bothering other people, having that self agency to take care of things yourself. I think maybe there, there's probably definitely a lot of ego and pride in that. And I think that was ingrained at a very young age. And frankly, the journey of becoming a founder has been this process of unlearning a lot of these cultural values, knowing which to retain. Like there's a difference between thriftiness and knowing how to conserve cash versus like literally saving every freaking dollar to a point where you're like scared to invest and invest in your growth. So like in my previous business, um, I was running like a meet, an education media company. I never ran a single Facebook ad and I was so proud of that. I said, oh, for six years, I grew this business using SEO to multiple six figures. And then people look at me and be like, you're stupid. Like you, you started that business in like Facebook prime golden years. Mm -hmm. But I now know it was because of my cultural background where I was like, to me, running a Facebook ad is like being in debt. It's like, I'm paying something out. I don't know if I'm gonna get it back. Right. And we, we're really taught not to, not to use debt in, I think in a lot of Asian culture. And so now I'm trying to just unlearn all of that. And it's a very, very yeah. difficult process. Do you still struggle with that? Do you feel, find yourself in moments still having that mentality? I do. Um, I'll it, share a couple of stories. So I, we started a company, there was three people, uh, they were all from mainland China. And so it was me and uh, these Chinese guys that came here to go to MIT, basically. And so we're all living together and, you know, we're getting to know each other super well. And one of the things I keep like hitting with them is that it's clear to me in their culture to say you're not good at something means you're lazy. And so it was, it was this thing where if you were the CEO and you know nothing about sales, it's almost like you want to learn everything and, and coding, you want to learn anything and you, uh, marketing, you want to learn everything because it's lazy if you're, if you're not the expert. And so what ends up happening is every time we would hire someone for that role to be the expert in that thing, there wouldn't be any trust. There would be tr a tremendous amount of friction there. I remember one day we had like this, we had a bunch of beers and stuff and we had a long chat and I was like, why do you do that? You know, I'm like, cause you, I don't think it's your intent to create this culture of toxicity where nobody trusts you. But what's happening is it's a symptom of your inability to trust. And what is that? And there was two parts of it. One part was like education. And so if the person didn't go to like Harvard or MIT, he, he didn't, didn't trust them. The second part of it is he didn't value sales skills. Like he valued engineering skills. It was like, 
it's binary if if you don't know how to code you go i don't know how to code right. done that's but talking to people all of a sudden everybody thinks they're good at that which is a skill that i would say not everybody is good at and so over time it was this thing of exactly what you're saying he had to unlearn i'll say this much i think he's still unlearning i think it's yeah. very very difficult for some people i i think it's so and it's actually one of the reasons why i think uh, a lot of first time founders like we're scared to pay for even things like a coach, an executive coach. But sometimes the purpose of an executive coach is to label, hey, this is an insecurity of yours, or like this is something that's actually holding you back from evolving to the next level of where you need to be. And if, this, if the co-founders are not evolving, the company's not gonna evolve. So what you said is exactly right. Like, you know, for the first year or so, I think my co-founder and I, we said, we wanna, like if, before we hire for anything, before we outsource anything, we have to do it ourselves. We have to learn it properly. And that's a huge flaw. That's not, that's ex the opposite way of scaling a company fast, right? You want to hire experts to take care of the things that you're weak at. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's basically, that's a great story. It's hard. It's really difficult. I think even like, I'll say Nick is learning this now to some extent, my buddy over here. So <laughs> yeah. It's, it's this thing where like when we started the podcast, we did maybe six episodes and quickly realized like, I think I've learned you have to hire the team, you know, to think like people look at my social media and they might be, Oh, he's pretty good at it. But it's clear to me when you hire a pro, it's clear that you're an amateur when you're watching a pro. And you and that distinction can be made if you're watching tennis or sports. It's like, oh, obviously I'm not LeBron. Look how clear this is. But there are people in every business world that are similar, right? That there's like somebody who's way better at yeah. creating YouTube clips than me and social media than me. And so our job is to identify them and hire them. And we've seen what happens like us investing and I like quote investing in our podcast by hiring people when we were making no money was absolutely the right move because it led to the revenue. It led to the collaborations. It led to us talking to more, you know, amazing people like yourself. And I think that's, it's the switch of, you need to start realizing what's required. And I think a lot of people, and I'll say some of it's cultural, but I think another part of it is just everybody wakes up or who's born without, let's say a tremendous amount of money yeah. has you know, a relationship with money that is totally unhealthy. And if you want to become a startup founder, that needs to die. Yes. You need to start. And I explained it to people, like if you and I were going to go to San Francisco right now, we would never talk about gas, mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't talk about it. If we were going to take a flight, we wouldn't talk about jet fuel. And that to me is money, yeah. right? You're going to get there once you've identified what are we going to do in San Francisco? Oh, cool. We'll go to this vineyard, this place. Well, okay, cool. But you, no one will talk about gas yeah. and money's very much the same way. It's just like an energy resource that's required but it's required for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you opening up. I mean, I think that's something that, uh, it's good to share it with our listeners. Cause I think that's, a, that's like what we want to talk about on our podcast is yeah. the realities of unlearning some things, the things that hold you back. And that's, I'm sure it wasn't easy for you to no. identify that <laughs> yeah. for sure. There's a lot of this whole journey of, of starting the company has been as much personal development as it has been professional and just understanding that and I think even with our team, you know, when I do one-on-ones with them, I do treat part of these one-on-ones as almost like a mini therapy session. We'll say, hey, man, let's analyze what you got done this week. And, you know, what's the thing that you created the most problems for you this week? And you'll start to see patterns where you say like, hey, notice that you're getting stuck in this mid-funnel. Like, what's the mindset that's holding you back here? And you just like, you, f you find these things, like you said, these insecurities that maybe they're scared to admit, but once you help them label it, they're like, oh shit, like you're totally right. You, you're able to objectively see this pattern as an external party that I couldn't see. And literally the next week they're, they've like solved that problem and they've like scaled themselves. So it is a, is an interesting, uh, cause you don't default to thinking about those when you're like working on a business, I guess. You know? There are some pros of the Asian culture that I will say like, uh, at some <laughs> point you, you really understand that you want to make your parents proud. And so, and so raising capital is like the moment of doing it. Right. Right. Uh, getting, getting the article. I, I've it, seen it. It's like, that's the thing you've done it now. It's funny. Yeah. You're, I think I might've gotten a little bit more jaded to that because I had spent time in venture before. Okay. And when you're in venture, you, yeah, you know what it means. You, not yeah. just, you're actually like trained to basically know like, Hey, this is just one piece of the milestone. And in fact, most founders may not even be that happy that they had to fundraise. Like for them, a lot of founders, the best founders I know are like, you know, I'd rather be great at operating a good profitable business. Like if I had to fundraise them and I had to give a piece of my company away. And sometimes it's necessary for rapid scale. And like, when you see a massive market you want to take over, I think it makes a ton of sense. But again, like most of the best founders you speak to, like, uh, you know, Ross McKay over at, uh, at Daring, like we all kind of just say like, look, it's just one piece 
it's not really what's going to make or break our business. So totally true. When did you guys raise once you had a couple prototypes that you liked? Yeah. Well, so we spent about, I want to say my co-founder and I spent around eight months, like nights and weekends at our full-time jobs. We quit. We spent another maybe like six to eight months bootstrapping and just building a prototype. When we felt comfortable that we had a product we could show to investors, we went out and we raised our pre-seed round. We did that primarily because the MOQs in our industry for instant ramen, it's not like, there's actually no, really no American manufacturers for this stuff. We luckily found one and that's a, there's actually a crazy story behind this at some point, but the MOQs are massive. They're like typically how much? six figures. Okay, um, wow. So it's pallets. N- it's not like tr- other industries where you can get away with like a $30,000 MOQ run. Wow. So we knew pretty quickly that there was no way we could self-finance this thing, which is unfortunate. It's a big risk, but that's why we went out and we raised. When you were raising, what was, did people get it? Were you like, here's the market, it's massive. And then you say, this is the better for you category of that. They go, oh, that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. And then you go, that's it. <laughs> well, I, I think... Raising money for this type of business may not have worked th- maybe five, three to five years ago. I think there, a lot has changed in the in the world, frankly, with what's going on with media, um, what's going on with like music. Um, there's just a lot more awareness. Um, it's crazy. Sometimes during the pandemic, we were calling a bunch of our customers in our beta co- in our like private community, and we're like, "Hey, uh, we did a user interview. We just want it's like very tech like of us. We just want to be like, hey, how did you hear about us? Like, why why do you need this product?" And when I was talking with this, this very nice Caucasian, like older lady who's a teacher in the Midwest. And I was like, how did you hear about Amy? And she said, oh, well, you know, it's a pandemic right now. Um, I've been stuck at home and Netflix recommended this Korean drama. And I've never watched a Korean drama in my life. It was called like Crash Landing on You. And she was like, I watched it and I got really hooked on it. And like in the show, I just watched these like Korean people like eating ramen and she can't eat like unhealthy stuff. So she was like, so I just typed like healthy ramen. I found you guys. And I was like, well, that's crazy to me that like wow. there's a direct correlation between like media and like you discovering our product and then you being interested in it. That's a great journey. And right. it's, it's a really cool journey. And wow. it, honestly, that's how most things in life work is like you see it on TV or, you know, see in media, like, right. I, I grew up, you know, I <laughs> but grew you up can't as, manufacture that funnel. <laughs> you can't manufacture <laughs> that funnel. Like, no. I, you know, I grew up as a nineties kid and my parents didn't speak English that well. I was an only child. And so what did I watch on TV? I watched like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Mm-hmm. And that's what got me into like hip hop. And like, so it's like, these are the things you see them on TV. And then it's like, that's what influences a lot of your life. So going back to your, um, your question, I think when we went out and we raised, we made a conscious effort. I think like over 50% of our cap table is like AAPI or, or female uh, investors. But the other 50% that are not, even they kind of just understood the story. Like when we told them, we said, look, you know, the same trends I mentioned where it's like Asian food is the fast growing cuisine American. Part of that is because I think in Asian culture, when you try the, 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 the range of tastes and textures, I think they're more willing to like pair certain things that maybe weren't, aren't traditional, quote unquote traditional. And so when you have like uh, people in the U.S. who try these Asian flavors, they're almost always like, whoa, this is like so different than my, the typical American palate. And once you try that and you have that flavor explosion, you're like, I don't really want to go back. And I think that's like a very standard thing that happens. And so, um, for example, like Palm Tree Crew, which is Kaigo's team, you know, it's all like it's it's a there's definitely a lot of like Caucasian men, but they all love Asian food. Like all of them actually, they know ramen, they eat it. It wasn't actually that hard to explain to them. And um, so I think I'm very fortunate to be born in a time where people ahead of me have paved the way in culture. Um, it's also one of the reasons why we make a conscious effort uh, to raise from people who, you know, like are in the music industry or, you know, actors and actresses, like people who we think can help bring Emmy into mainstream culture. Cause that is going to be what propels more mainstream adoption of a better for you ramen. For That's example. true. Was the carb thing always part of the plan? Like the low carb option? Yeah, it was, that was the number one thing we really wanted because especially in Asian culture, it's all like starches, like yeah, refined starch. like refined carbs. And so that is what leads to a lot of the diabetes. And so again, diabetes is not something we talk about publicly. Like you don't want to be labeled like the diabetic food. But when we were creating this product, for example, we like we were wearing like levels, continuous glucose, uh, glucose monitors. We were like metabolic health is very important. I think especially post COVID, it's, it's even more important now. Yeah. And so we wanted to make sure, for example, that like Amy did not spike your blood sugar and it doesn't. But yeah, I think that was a very important thing for us. 
the plant-based proteins, again, it was because like my parents, once they switched to a plant-based diet, naturally you're also just like using, you're using less sauces and stuff. And so I think their blood pressure dramatically decreased. Um, my co-founder actually eats, he, crazy story is like he used to train to be like a Buddhist monk like a long time ago. It's like part of Thai culture and that's like a very plant forward diet. That's a career diet. change. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Well, he did it for like, it wasn't like a very long period of time, but it was important to us. And, and then the high protein is just like very natural. It's just like consumers... Honestly, the, mo the mainstream consumer audience does not even understand, frankly, like low carb that much, but they understand like high protein and plant-based is interesting. I think it's, we spent about two years in R&D trying to get the low carb noodle. That's actually like where the bulk of the work went. Yeah. But now, when, now that we've launched PR, our investors, like their LPs introduced us as like, these are the plant-based ramen guys, Oh no way! which is hilarious because it's like the plant-based, like the noodles are obviously always plant-based. It's actually the seasoning packet most traditional ramen brands all have meat-based ingredients and we've found a way to recreate the flavors but i do think the low carb came first before the plant-based when you guys are raising what's is it a valuation of like 5x your revenues like for cpg what's the normal cpg so the ranges that i've seen are anywhere from three to eight x at the okay. like you know call it pre-seed seed i think series a becomes a lot more data driven so i it really varies. And are you guys in stores now? Or what was your go-to-market strategy from the jump? Was it try to get the people to go to the consumer? Or was it go to stores? What, what was that? Because my co-founder and I kind of came from the tech world, we felt we we don't have like marketing backgrounds by any anyway. I've kind of become the de facto CMO as my co-founder does product ops and finance. We focus a lot on community. And what that means is like prior to building IMI, I had built uh, the world's first and largest product management community. It was called Product Manager HQ. My co-founder, Kei Chen, was a lead product manager at Facebook, leading their social video team, and he was building products for creators to manage their communities. So both of us, when we came into this business, we said, look, we want to take a community-driven approach. And that's not that doesn't mean like build a newsletter. Like that's an audience. That's not a community. We built a private Facebook group. We chose Facebook because when we did demand testing, we actually ran like a series of ad tests to test what our target audience would be, what the value props would be for them. Mm -hmm. It sounds very scientific. It's not, it's, it's just not, like, yeah, no, we just it. did it to do some basic demand testing. Sure. But um, we realized that our initial core audience was definitely more female heavy, like, and generally between like 35 As the buyer or the, as the consumer? As a consumer. Okay. Yeah, it was, it leaned that way in the beginning and it was like a 35 plus audience. And we knew from our tech days that that's an audience that lives heavily on Facebook. So. Um, for anyone listening, like, don't overthink your medium. Like, people are always like, do, you have, do I have to do Discord, Circle, like, Facebook, WhatsApp? Just pick where your audience lives. Um, for us, it was Facebook, so we did a Facebook group. And we built that up to around 4,000 members. Um, that did eventually, like, they spread the word. We built a, an email list around 35,000 people. And this was all prior to our launch. But I think that community was really powerful because people are in there, even today, sharing recipes. They're, like, talking to each other. They're connecting with each other. And that's really where an audience becomes a community, right? Is when the members are talking to each other versus just like the brand to the audience. So I think that really helped kickstart our launch pretty dramatically. It's it's why a lot of people heard about our launch. Now we are D2C, Amazon, GoPuff, like talking to Thrive Markets of the world. We have one uh, big retailer that we're very excited about, um, Whole Foods, that we will roll out with in late April. So that's coming up soon. That's going to be the first foray. And then after that, uh, I think the floodgates will open, and so we'll we'll definitely want to push pretty heavily on retail after that. One of the barriers that comes to my mind when you enter into a market like this is is price. And i've I've thought about this from a different culture perspective. Like I know that Mexican food stems from a, a culture of street food, same with Asian food. You have street food vendors there. And there's this idea that persists in people's minds that, it has to be cheap. Mm -hmm. And certainly the ramen market is not helped by companies like, like Top Ramen, uh, who, you know, it's, it's like 30 cents right. for a packet or whatever it is. So how, how do you overcome that barrier mm -hmm. when you enter into the market as, as a better for you product? It, it's, it's higher price, but it is worlds away from, from the bottom dollar Top Ramen of the market. So yeah, what is your strategy for dealing with that? That's a great question. That is the primary concern that we had, that investors had. Everyone figured like, hey, uh, better for you ramen, like low carb, high protein plant-based, lower sodium, sounds great. But how do you get around that price barrier when it's, it's almost anchored in people's minds that this is like a cheap food? So there's a couple of things. One is we actually, you know, when we first started, we thought that the majority of the US all 
ate instant ramen, like, you know, maybe like the first time they had ramen was instant ramen. That was like an assumption we had made because I think we grew up eating so much instant ramen, but you quickly realize that actually there's a lot of people in the U S their first entrance into ramen was actually at a ramen restaurant, which ramen restaurants are now popular all across the U S. And when you go to a ramen restaurant, you're paying like 15 to 20 bucks a bowl for them when they all of a sudden they see like, Oh wait, I can make this stuff at home. And it's like delicious, same texture, like, but it's healthy. Now it's at six bucks with, you know, on our website, it's like six twenty-five. They're like, that's a steal. And so that was very interesting to us. And luckily in the beginning, before we even built the product, we did because of that demand testing, we had already built the landing page. We were collecting pre-orders. So we knew from the metrics that there wasn't, there was demand for this, but that was also just like, it was great to see that happen. Um, I think the second thing is like most premium better for you brands, this is almost inevitable, inevitable. Like we have to launch at this price point. Um, we actually learned this, uh, one of our other investors, Justin Mares, who founded, uh, kettle and fire, which is like the first like premium bone broth brand. You know, when he launched each box of bone broth, it was like half the size of the next like, you know, broth company. Yeah. And it was like 1199, but it's the size you need. It's the size you need. That's right. the thing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't true. go back in the fridge. It's a one-time use. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was like 1199 and your next closest broth was like 299. And you know, he said, look, you know, you would think that's insane, but when you launch with a price point like that, you very quickly find your core, like evangelist, the people who need your product, it's a hair on fire problem for them. Frankly, they're willing to pay anything because it just, just doesn't exist for them. And so he actually was the one that like initially when we launched, we wanted to go even lower and just take a margin hit. But he said, no, like launch it because you'll find that core audience. You'll grow with them. It'll allow you to then get to the economies of scale where then you can lower the price over time. So I think that's a scary thing for most entrepreneurs is like, you're like, oh man, I really don't want to like increase my price. I'm kind of scared what it's going to do. But if you really feel that you are solving a true need, which we did feel we were, um, there's a large percentage of America who for health reasons or lifestyle reasons cannot eat ramen anymore. They are the ones that are super excited and you have to stick with them. It's going to suck because you know, for that first year, you're going to get a lot of backlash. A lot of our Facebook ads, the comments are like, oh man, this is really expensive. Like, how are you guys selling? Now, I think that dialogue has really changed where people are more familiar with their brand. We're able to message, hey, this is like a meal replacement. You're getting 22 grams of protein, 18 grams of fiber, and only like five grams of net carbs. Like, where are you going to find that in a, in a meal right. for six bucks? And so that, I think, has changed the conversation dramatically. That's how I look at it. So it's, it's interesting when I think about, it's almost like you graduated. It's almost, it's almost like when I think about an ad campaign you could do, it's like you graduated. Right. Right. It's like literally stop eating that. Totally. Right. <laughs> and so I think that's, how do you guys go about the marketing side of it? That's actually a great, uh, what you just said is exactly, it. it's almost like, like for example, like Patrick Schwarzenegger, one of our investors, he actually gave us a quote once for our website. And it was something like, you know, I used to feel so guilty eating instant ramen and now I don't have to anymore because Emmy is like delicious. Blah, blah, blah. That has been like the best performing copy that we've been able to test. And it's because it resonates with so many people. It's where like, you talk to anyone again, like you talk to anyone on the street and they usually say like, man, I've like, I love instant ramen. It tastes so good, but I just feel so bad. Like I feel so guilty eating it. I can't do this as an adult. Yeah. And it's so, like smoking cigarettes or something. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's very much like the magic spoon approach. Um, right. Like sure. Gabby and Greg are advisors to us and they have a very similar messaging, which is like, you know, you probably feel guilty eating all this sugary cereal and it's not meant for adults, but we created the cereal for adults and we've really created the ramen for adults. So what's next for you guys? What's on the horizon for this year besides whole foods? Obviously that's big. Uh, yeah. I think one thing we're definitely very proud of is, um, because we didn't start with that, with the food science backgrounds, uh, we were able to hire our first full-time food scientist this year. That's been incredible. And, you know, he's been really cranking on a lot of things behind the scenes. So new flavors, noodle improvements. We aren't talking too much about our, our next product extension, but you know, I think the nice thing about Emmy is because we're a better for you, Asian American food brand, we can really expand into any category you want yeah. under Asian American food. And I think the theme really is like me and my co-founder, we started this business also because like, not just for our mission and the health, but because we just wanted to have fun along the way. I think it's important to have fun. A lot of entrepreneurs take themselves super seriously. It seems super stressful. And I think for us, it's like, we just want to recreate these like nostalgic fun foods we grew up eating. And we don't really need to follow the whole CPG playbook of, you know, only expand 5% left or right in your category. That's the advice we get from old school CPG people. But, you know, our mission at our company is like, we create foods that embolden people to play by their own rules in life. And that was a very deliberate wording because 
when we started, people were like, there's no, you cannot invent this kind of instant ramen. And we were like, screw it. Let's just play around in our kitchens, like we'll mess around. And we invented it. And I think if we really want to live by that mission that we tell our consumers, then we have to be able to be bold and try totally different things in different categories um, that no one would think to reinvent under that kind of Asian American product landscape. Um, and it doesn't have to be directly tangential or like adjacent to instant ramen. Well, in that vein, there's a blog post on your website that talks about your and K Chan's favorite Asian snack foods. <laughs> nice. <laughs> if I'm reading into it, read the tea I'm leaves. I'm read seeing it. <laughs> the that future, the roadmap. A, a, a market that's also ripe for innovation in the better for you brand. Totally. Any thoughts on maybe you know, reinventing Pocky or, or whatever the, the next uh, candy idea might be. That is definitely, and I, you know, we have a whole backlog. Yeah. Um, if you think about it, right? So he's hanging out with Ross. He's hanging out right. with Dave. Yeah. <laughs> You're hanging out with I all mean, the right that, people. You, to, you to have a, there's a, there's an opportunity there to take over the dessert, the yeah. better for you dessert. Mm -hmm. I will say like, unlike maybe like the American food space, the Asian food space is still very nascent and growing. Um, like I want to give a shout out to like a lot of brands like Amsam is making like amazing Asian sauces. You have Fly by Jing who's doing like chili crisp. Sanzo, which is making like sparkling water that's Asian flavors. Um, like Nectar, which is the first like Asian hard seltzer. There's only so many of us. Right. And I think like when I first started in this industry, it goes back to that personal development thing. Like it's easy to feel competitive. It's easy to think like, oh man, like what have we all expanded into each other's spaces? But I think that's a very like, they say, especially with like minorities, that's like a thing that happens where it's like, you feel like you're competing for the same spot. And therefore you're like, you, you're, you feel this like strange competition when there really, there's only so many, you should be like helping each other grow the market. And it took me a long time to realize like, I want to approach like everyone with like a position of love. And I, I know that sounds very like woo woo and hippie, but like we do have to grow the market together. And you know, I remember talking with, um, there's this guy in Oakland who runs um, Hodo Tofu, which is like the best tofu that every single like fine dining restaurant in America uses. And he was telling me like when he started his business, he ran his own factories in, in Oakland mm -hmm. and with his competitors, when their machines broke down, he would literally be like, hey, just come to use my like manufacturing equipment and produce your own tofu. And so his competitors would do that and then they would produce tofu using his machines and then they would go sell it and compete against him. And I was like, why would you do that? And he said, well, look, man, like we have to grow the market together, right? Like we're in this together. You grow the, what is it? The rising tide, all ships rise in rising tide. Like there's room for all of us. And I think that has been an incredible lesson where everywhere I go now, I'm trying to give shout outs to like everyone in our communities who are trying to like build their own brands because we have to lift each other's up. And so, and I'm, of course, like, I'm going to like, you know, I love all my, like my other friends who are doing like all the other products, but I just want to shout that out for anyone listening. I think that's important. Yeah. And mind share too, right? It's like you guys can in some way accelerate each other's growth. I think that's the other reality because you're all learning things on the fly. Like the guy who gave you the advice around your pricing, like that's huge. Right. Right. And so that saves you a lot of time, helps you accelerate, you get velocities faster. And so it, everybody wins. You were going to say you had a really good story around finding your uh, supplier. Oh yeah. Our first manufacturer, when we first started, we actually wanted to manufacture internationally at first, but there's a lot of like FDA laws, like, sure, yeah. and then, um, COVID obviously happened, the border shut down. And so we had to find like basically manufacturer in the U S and there aren't really any instant ramen manufacturers in the U S there's maybe like a couple, but they usually are with the huge giants or they're owned by the giants. So we found one in California and everyone was saying like, this is your only shot. Like you have to work with them and they're not even instant ramen manufacturers. Like they'll make noodles, but you're going to have to work with them somehow. And so we were like, okay, well, they're our only shot. Everyone's been recommending them to us. Like it's kind of a Hail Mary, but let's reach out. So my co-founder like emailed their VP of sales like once, no response. Emails them again, twice, no response. And like, we're sitting at my kitchen table because that's where we work every day. And he calls the guy and this VP of sales gets on the phone and was like, I already saw both of your emails. Like this is a waste of my time and hung up on my co-founder. And I was like listening because I could hear it through the speaker. And I just got really like I was angry because I was like, you don't need to disrespect people. Like you can say like politely, like, Hey, this is just, you know, it's not going to work. And so I immediately just like went on LinkedIn. I like found, I was like, I looked at the company and I was like, I got to find someone at this company. Mm -hmm. And so I find someone and then I find a mutual connection. That mutual connection is like someone I knew on Twitter. So I DM the person on Twitter. I was like, Hey, do you know this person? She happened to do like an undergraduate internship years ago with this person. And I cold emailed this person and she works at the company. She's like, you know, a pretty senior position. And she emails me back. She's like, why don't we get on a phone call? So I pitch her on the phone. 
she's like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Like, uh, are you going to be in LA anytime? We were in SF. So she was like, are you going to be in LA anytime? Like, I'd love to have you like grab some coffee. And I said, oh yeah, I'm actually planning to be there like next Monday. So it's like a Friday. And I hang up and I tell my co-founder, I'm like, yo, we're, we're booking flights. We got to go now, like Monday. So we just like made up an excuse. Monday, she actually is like, she, like an hour before the meeting, she's like, hey, actually, I want you to come by the office. And luckily we, we were wearing like business casual and we showed up and like, it was a full like board meeting. Like she had like her team there. We had to do a full pitch. We had like a presentation. Wow. And turns out that the person was like the daughter of the CEO. Like she basically was going to take over the company. And she was like, yeah, I like, I just really liked your like perseverance here. And like the fact that you guys showed up and pitched and they, that's how we landed our relationship with our manufacturer. I love that. And story. so I always tell people, I'm like, don't take that first note. Like sometimes yeah. you got to know when not to brute force through a door and like change directions. Like I'm guilty of that. My co-founder helps me, but sometimes I just like to brute force. And that was yeah. an instance where you just can't say no. Tell yeah. me the VP of no. sales was in that boardroom with his head down the entire time. So the awkward thing is like when we showed up, she said like, oh, he's not going to be joining. She didn't give me a reason why, but obviously it's kind of awkward. Yeah. So the director of sales was there. And once we finished the pitch, like she was so happy with the pitch that she came out and she personally apologized. She was like, hey, I want to let you know that I spoke with this VP of sales. That was like an unacceptable response. And like, that's not going to happen again. But unfortunately, we don't work with this manufacturer anymore because I think once COVID restrictions let up, we wanted to go back to you know, our original plan. Sure. But very grateful they took a chance on us. Yeah, um, that's yeah, a great story. And, and yeah, I think anyone and in listening fairness out there, to the VP of sales, it, it could have been that the deal wouldn't have been big enough for no, his own commission. And so there, exactly. there, there might have been a real logic to that. Sure. Uh, there, there was a lot of logic. Not to the behavior, but just to the yeah. response. I agree with that. I think to be fully empathetic, I like he probably gets pitched hundreds of times a day <laughs> yeah. from like random brands like us that are like, don't end up amounting to anything. And, but I think it was important for that daughter of the CEO to see like, Hey, well, they found another in. And for you and your journey to recognize sometimes it does work, right? Sometimes going around is the yeah. best way of doing it. And that's awesome. I mean, that's a really good story. I love that. Yeah. The good thing was for myself, it definitely taught me like, Hey, you know, sometimes you, you do have to find that third door in, but I think that has also come like to bite me in the ass sometimes because it's almost like you, you shoot the arrow without aiming at first or like it's like that George Washington story of like if you cut down a tree, spend the first like 55 minutes sharpening the axe before you cut the tree. My co-founder has definitely given me feedback. He is like, hey, dude, like you have a tendency to want to break down every single door. He's like, sometimes it's OK to like step back and reevaluate the door and just like open the right door versus like always trying to break down the, that door. And so I think we're a good combination where I tend to be like the initiator or like the leaper. And then he's really good at like maximizing the resources we have or like helping me realign. So it's, it's a great complimentary. Deal. I've been asking everybody this. So obviously NFT crypto, it's the whole rage. Are you guys thinking about <laughs> it? How, how do you guys maybe interact with it? What's the, what's the mindset or just heads down, focus on your product, your launch. I think having come from tech, we are a lot more flexible and open-minded. And I think when you have a lot of smart people in the world talking about something, shying away from it or choosing to like just ignore it is probably not the smartest decision for us we personally um, have invested in the space quite a bit back just from our own days mm -hmm. i think cpg there are a lot of interesting use cases for nft i think some brands are really trying to force fit it a little bit too much and my concern is that the mainstream population you know your middle of america customer you tell them what an NFT is, you tell them how to open a MetaMask wallet, they're gonna have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Right. And if you launch some NFT and you say like, oh, but this will grant you access to special drops or like, you know, like a gated portion of our website. It's like, well, you could just do that without saying the word NFT. So maybe it's a rebranding thing, but um, I do wanna be sensitive to not having customers be super confused as to like why all of a sudden Immy is launching an NFT and what that means for them. Doesn't mean we don't, we don't want to be like a pioneer in the industry, but until I see like an, a really solid use case for it, um, I don't think that's going to be our core focus. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, brother. I really appreciate yeah, it, no, Kevin. Tell thanks everyone where me. they can find you and your brand. Obviously, Whole Foods in April. Yeah, that's very exciting for us. We, you can find us at uh, emmyeats.com. We could not get emmy.com because it's a very expensive domain. <laughs> so we attached the word eats. and But uh, you can find us there. Personally, on Twitter, you can always find me at Kevin Lee Me. And so... Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming yeah, on. Yeah, pleasure. That was our conversation with Kevin Lee, co-founder of Emmy. I think it's safe to assume that if you made it this far, you've enjoyed the show. So consider subscribing if you're not already. Or better yet, leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It's one of the best and easiest ways you can support us. 
And of course, you can find us on social media platforms at Startup Storefront or on our website, startupstorefront.com. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Music by Double Touch. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.